Hi. Okay. So welcome again. This is Persisting Digital Resources by and for Communities, which is part of the Event Fund Seminar Series. So I am very excited today to have Katrina Fenlin, um, who will be speaking with us um, to think and talk about digital objects as community resources. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Katrina um, and uh, let you drive the show. Great, thank you, Angela. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to try to wield all of my Zoom professor skills that I've honed over the past couple of years of the pandemic to watch the chat while I present. Um, so if you have questions or um, or, or want me to slow down or anything like that, please um, feel free to pop something in the chat or we're a small enough group that I'm happy for you also to interrupt me. Um, and, and just, yeah, I'm hoping this will be an interactive session and, um, and we can just have a conversation about persistence and um, the term I use, sustainability. So I'm um, beaming in from College Park, Maryland. This is, I'm at the University of Maryland College Park. This is a suburb of Washington, DC, um, inside of the Beltway and um, on the ancestral territories of the Piscataway and Nakashtank and their indigenous kin and neighbors. Um, and what I'm speaking to you about today is my area of research. So I'm in the College of Information Studies here. I'm an information scientist, um, a library and information scientist by training. And my expertise is in what I call digital curation. And we'll talk um, just in a moment about what that means. But my um, original title for the talk today was Sustaining Community Engagement. And so as a sort of preview of the main takeaway from this talk, um, my goal of my research has been to sort of reframe the question of what it means to sustain digital objects through community engagement around instead the question of what it means to sustain communities through digital objects. Um, so sort of taking a, a reverse approach. Okay, so just a little bit more about myself. Um, I work in the College of Information Studies. These are probably a, a sort of genre of school and academic program that might be unfamiliar to you. But my area of expertise is in what we call data curation or digital curation, which is to say the management and preservation of digital resources so that they stay accessible and useful to different kinds of communities um, over time. So thinking in the long term. So the images I'm showing on the screen are from one of my projects, which I selected to show you because I thought it might be more familiar to a group of people with a strong interest in open science. Um, so a collaboration with the National Agricultural Library to understand what it means to take their archival records, their historical scientific records and make them useful as data. So what it means to turn them into data to support contemporary and ongoing scientific research. So this is thinking about what it means to transform the historical record into scientific data for reuse by new communities. Um, and, um, and I think that's exemplary of the kinds of work that I'm interested in, but most of my research is focused on work in the humanities. So um, the examples we'll be talking about today come from a research project on sustaining humanities data and particularly sustaining the research communities that surround different kinds of data, different digital projects in the humanities. And uh, I'll, I'll talk through these examples on the screen, the images you're seeing are coming from um, a few of my case studies of sustainability in that context. So we'll come back to that. So what these things have in common is that what I'm interested in is community-driven um, digital scholarship and science, um, especially stuff that is grassroots and open access. So thinking about the future of knowledge ecosystems in general across disciplines and what it means to sustain and preserve digital research um, as part of that ecosystem. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. And I think um, my main goal for today is to give you two things. One is a framework a conceptual framework of community-centered sustainability, which has come out of my research project, my study of these um, case studies of digital humanities projects, which I'll talk about. 
um, but hoping to show you its relevance across domains, including in the areas of work where you are um, producing events and resources. And then to adapt that framework to our main question that Angela has posed to, to me today, which is to how to keep the outputs of your work, of your events, and of your um, um, work more generally lively and useful in the long term. So I'm going to show you some exemplary resources that can help support you in this work and, um, and hope they provide examples of the kinds of things you can be looking for that are openly available on the web to support you in this work. Okay, so um, the main thing that I'm offering you, I will say, actually, I'll say on this front, this framework of community-centered sustainability is the outcome of my research. The resources I'm going to show you are not mine. They're sort of a list of my some of my favorite things that I want to um, share with you. So um, may, my main offering today is conceptual, helping, hopefully, um, helping you frame the question for yourselves of how to um, approach persistence in a sort of precise and comprehensive way. Um, and if we can accomplish that through the slide deck, I'm hoping I've left enough time at the end that we can do it maybe in dialogue with each other. Um, and I will also just say before I jump into um, this framework that I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all today. This um, was an organization that I was not familiar with when, um, when I began speaking with Angela, and I'm just so excited about the work that CSNS is doing and also by the work that you all are doing as grantees, I've gotten to explore your projects a little bit. I'd love to hear more about them um, in our dialogue section at the end of this talk. And uh, yeah, it's just fascinating, the work that, you're that you've undertaken. Okay, so the basic problem confronting us is how do we keep digital scholarship, digital science, um, the digital outputs of our work alive, which is to say open, and accessible and useful and community engaged on the web. So how are we keeping them lively? This is what I loved, uh, the provocation in the event description that Angela wrote, um, the term lively. Um, and the reason I love it is because it provides a really nice contrast to a separate concept, a distinct concept, um, that of preservation. So. I'm drawing a subtle distinction here between what it means to keep things alive and functioning in a community engaged way on the web versus what it means to preserve objects over time, to preserve the bits, to keep things as they are, almost like a metaphor sort of fixing them in amber. So this distinction between sustainability and preservation, in reality, most projects undertake both um, things, but distinguishing them can be very useful. And we'll come back to that distinction a little later on. So the problem is what it means to preserve a living, active resource. Or if not the resource itself, maybe we're trying to preserve something a little more nebulous, like a community or a particular impact, a social impact or something, some kind of intellectual contribution that stands apart from the digital resources themselves. Or maybe we're trying to preserve all of those things or sustain them over time. So in my world of work, um, the context of a study in the digital humanities, what makes this really difficult um, is a set of systemic factors. And I imagine they're probably familiar to you, even if they aren't all true for you in your world of work. Um, but what makes it really hard to sustain digital humanities scholarship on the web over time, um, the first factor is financial constraints. So the vast majority of these projects are funded on short cycles. Um, they um, they they rely heavily on grant funding. They often don't have any kind of um, long term institutional support. So they might be born within, you know, um, uh, faculty members work within an academic institution, um, but the institution has made no long term commitments to the project or keeping it around um, or they're born in the work of a community outside of any institution. And it's very hard to find any kind of institutional home for these projects. Um, they rely heavily on volunteer labor. It's often unfunded work. Um, and they're often technically fragile. So the examples I'm going to show you are things that don't rely on um, common 
um, web services. They, they're sort of built from scratch to serve a particular purpose on the web. And so technically they have a lot of fragile components, vulnerable components. Um, and then they're also sort of disconnected from the systems of scholarly communication that often keep cultural heritage and humanities objects alive. Um, and they are prone to broader systemic inst instabilities that all of our work is prone to. So um, yeah, so problems confronting universities as sites for this work or um, different kinds of communities as sites for this work. And then also of course, global um, instabilities like climate change are threatening projects like this. Okay, so there's a bunch of factors, a whole complex of factors that make keeping these resources alive on the web really difficult. And I'm gonna show you some of these resources so you have a sense of the kinds of things I'm talking about. And then I wanna come back to the factors, um, or the, sorry, the responses that we've taken in the past to resolving this problem. Okay, so here are my four case studies. Um, these images illustrate the four case studies that I've undertaken as part of this research project. Um, and I want to, I think in this talk, given how little time we have, I'm going to focus on one in particular, but briefly, these are all projects, the goal of which is to gather digital evidence um, and, and to collect it and make it accessible to support new kinds of research in a field of work. So um, the first, the MEI Music Encoding Initiative, the goal of that is to take sheet music or written music and re-encode it so that it is easily manipulable and understandable by machines. So that's called the Music Encoding Initiative. The enslaved.org project, the goal of this, um, is some of it is sort of previewed on the screen here, is to create a massive hub of interlinked data about the lives of a historically enslaved people. So it, it's sort of creating a, a massive data source on the transatlantic slave trade um, to bring together all these historians' work on um, on um, constructing data sets to study the slave trade, but also to bring in public contributions, um, family histories and the records of cultural institutions and to provide a home for that to support research, not only by scholars, but also by um, people interested in their own family history. Open ITI, um, the Open Islamic Hit Texts Initiative, the goal of this project is to build a corpus of Islamic Hit texts. So um, for example, texts in Persian, texts in Arabic, um, historical texts to make them amenable to machine use. So make them amenable to new kinds of analysis um, and data science work. Um, and then the last project, which is the one I'll focus on is a community archiving project. So the Lakeland Community Heritage Project, the Lakeland Digital Archive, the goal of this effort is to build a digital archive to serve the Lakeland community, which is a historically African-American community here in College Park, Maryland, adjacent to the university campus um, that was largely displaced by the process of urban renewal um, in the 60s and 70s. And so this archive is serving to help keep connected a community that has undergone some level of diaspora um, and to also document their contributions to the region and the history of the region. So that's a lot of projects that I've just laid out there and we'll focus on the Lakeland project as an example, but the goal of my, re my research has been to study how each of these different projects, each trying to do different kinds of research about cultures and people and languages and histories um, that are sort of underrepresented in mainstream archives, um, how each of them conceptualizes sustainability differently for their own project. So what it means for each one to keep its project alive on the web means something different in every case. And it's because each one is surrounded by a different set of communities. So my goal today is to offer some details about how one of these cases conceptualizes sustainability, understands its communities, and builds its resources and its strategies around sustainability to serve its communities, um, and how that sheds light on what sustainability means, especially community-centered sustainability. So there's a lot on the screen. You don't need to read everything. Um, I want to point out the inner part of this wheel. 
Historically in data curation, my area of work, we have been focused on sustaining two main kinds of things, artifacts, so especially digital artifacts in my case, what it means to keep digital objects um, around, to preserve them and to make them accessible and useful over the long term. And the other thing we've been focused on sustaining are organizations. So what does it mean to keep an academic unit like a center, a research center, um, stable financially? Um, what are the business models for nonprofit organizations that create projects like the ones I just showed you? This is the research that goes into sustaining organizations. Much less attention in my field has gone into the role of communities in sustaining digital scholarship in general or digital science in the case of community-driven science projects. So there's been a lot of attention to sustaining artifacts and organizations, less attention to sustaining communities because it's a more nebulous concept um, and because it's been historically unclear what communities bring to the table, the role of artifacts, the role of organizations, it's intuitive. We know that for things to be sustainable, it can be very helpful to have some level of institutional affiliation for something that outlasts any given project or any given grant cycle, right? But thinking about communities can be a little more nebulous. So that's my goal today is to focus on um, what it means to sustain communities. This image, um, if you'd like to look at it in more detail and read a little more about, so what you're seeing in the outer circle is a set of um, sort of focuses or strategic approaches to sustaining these things. So for example, when we're sustaining artifacts, we're thinking about this set of factors. If you wanna dig into these strategies and these approaches, they're all captured in a white paper that I provided a link to in the resources section of the document that Angela linked to. Um, so I won't be able to get into even a fraction, you know, just the tiniest fraction of this today. So um, if you want more detail, it's in the white paper. It's all oriented towards digital humanities scholarship, but hopefully um, helpful outside of that. I think there's a lot in common with all kinds of open and grassroots um, research initiatives in different fields. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the communities aspect today. We are going to come back and touch on some artifact and organization oriented resources at the end of the talk, though. So we're focusing on the Lakeland Digital Archive today. And the definition of sustainability that's guiding my work with these communities and my research in general, um, I've called it community-centered sustainability. The definition is that a resource is considered to be sustained as long as it is supporting the endurance of the communities it's serving. It may serve them as a locus of memory, it may serve them as a locus of communication or research or collaboration or of knowledge production. As long as that resource is still supporting the endurance of the communities that it's aiming to serve, um, it is sustained. So that's for however long it's useful in whatever forms are useful. This is the definition that's guiding this research. And in my case studies of those four projects I described, um, I and my collaborators have identified a framework of six factors that contribute to this model of sustainability that determine whether something is sustainable from a community-centered perspective. And I'll show the factors now, um, but we'll only really dig into two of these today. We'll dig into the first two today. They are whether the resource or the project how these communities are engaging a wider set of interested and affected communities is a factor in their sustainability. We'll come back to that and dwell on that one. Um, and we'll also dwell on the second factor of how communities factor in to their sustainability planning, the well-being of their members and of the community as a whole. And uh, the rest of these we won't have time to dig into today, but I will, um, of course, there's a link to the white paper so you can get more detail there how communities reify their values, community values in the design of their projects. I believe you had an event um, grantee seminar on this last time, right? Really cool. Um, and then how communities navigate issues of ownership and control, um, how they implement an ecosystem perspective, which is to say how they understand them themselves and position themselves within a wider ecosystem, 
um, and then how communities embrace disruption and change over time. These all factor into their community-centered sustainability, but we'll talk about the first two today. And these are all sort of directly coming out of my research on how each of the four projects I mentioned, how each of these four projects understand sustainability differently. What they have in common is that all of them take into account these six factors in community-centered sustainability. Okay, so I wanna dig into the first two factors. But the first thing I want to point out is that every project defines sustainability for itself differently. They all did in my research and in my anecdotal experience of um, speaking to people who are running digital projects or have communities that they're maintaining. Um, they all define sustainability differently. There's a lot of text in the slide. I took a quick screenshot of a chart that's in the white paper, so I apologize for the aesthetic here, um, but I wanted to capture the different elements, just an example of a comparison of different elements of sustainability across two different projects. So an enslaved.org project, that's that big database of data about enslaved peoples, they consider that resource to be sustained as long as it's maintaining the linked data hub and a set of stories that are associated with it, maintaining an associated um, open access journal that they've developed um, that sort of exists in parallel to the data hub. Um, expanding their communities of use um, for family history, for example, and for teaching, um, and um, building scalable workflows to help bring in more contributions from a wider range of groups and institutions. These are the pieces of how they, in my work with them, defined what sustainability means. This is the set of things that they would see as markers of success for their sustainability. In contrast, the Lakeland community, this is a local community their community archiving project began long before any partnership with the University of Maryland has had an interesting relationship with um, researchers at the University of Maryland. Um, it's a truly community-based project with no um, former institutional affiliation. They've developed a, a volunteer-run small nonprofit organization for themselves that they use to build the community archive. And they're serving a public community. So not just a set of researchers interested in a specific topic, but um, a set of um, community members who are both local and also um, spread out. And so they define sustainability for their project very differently. They are thinking about community thriving. So what does it mean if, if the archive is sustained, is it contributing actively to the well-being of the community? Um, and to the restorative justice initiative that the community has undertaken. Um, is, it, um, is it maintained by the community itself or by a network of community partners? Is there a succession plan? Um, are there duplicate copies of the archives that are physically held by members of the community? So not under the control of a preservation institution, but do people in the community actually hold the archives and control the archives themselves? These are their factors in success. These are how they define sustainability. So very different visions here, or maybe I should say subtly different depending on your perspective, but the differences matter in terms of how they plan for and strategize for sustainability over time. The main difference is in how they engage the communities that they understand to be part of their um, sort of array of communities, invested communities. So part of my hope for today is to help us think more broadly about the communities that we are engaging with our work. So this is an example, a sort of conceptual illustration of how Lakeland Digital Archive understands its invested communities. And starting with the core members of the project team the few people, mainly volunteers, a couple of researchers from the university now, but originally um, volunteers and local historians from Lakeland, um, who are at the core of this, who are really running things, making all the decisions and doing all the labor of keeping the archive going and building it. This is the Lakeland Digital Archive team. So they are at the center of this model. Surrounding that, there's a slightly larger organization of people who are maybe not building the archive, but are interested in it, are consulted about every decision on it, uh, meet regularly about it. This is the Lakeland Community Heritage Project, and it's a nonprofit organization that um, sort of um, has ownership over this initiative. 
outside of that group, there's a still wider community. So this is descendants of, or sorry, this is residents of Lakeland and their descendants. So residents of historical Lakeland and their descendants, including those who have sort of scattered off into different places, some of them displaced by urban renewal, others just by change over time. Um, so these are the Lakelanders, the people who actually live there and identify with that community. Outside of that, there are the present day Lakeland residents, so those who live there, but maybe don't know the history or don't identify as Lakelanders in the same way. There's the university, um, and then there's wider college parks, so the city surrounding this community. Okay, outside of that, there's the Route 1 corridor, which is uh, you know, a geographic area um, in the suburbs of Washington, DC, um, defined by a set of communities that historically were interlinked by like, for example, school busing systems in the era of segregation. So this is a set of communities that have a shared connected history, um, but um, are not themselves Lakeland. And then even outside of that, the way Lakeland understands the communities that are invested in this work or potentially invested in this work, they're also including communities that might learn from their experience of building the digital archive. So those would be other community archives, unrelated community archives across the country or beyond um, who are interested in documenting their own histories or using the archives to help found a restorative justice movement, for example. Okay, these are all of the communities that in our interviews with and in our observations of um, the Lakeland group, um, they named as communities that might have some level of, of investment in the work that they're doing. And so these communities become part of their vision for what it means to sustain the project. I think when most of us think about sustaining a project or sustaining its outcomes, we're thinking about this core, this team of a few individuals who are really making things happen. Um, or we might be thinking about a slightly wider organizational level. Um, but Lakeland is imagining not just those, but also the wider surrounding communities that might be tapped in different ways or engaged in different ways to benefit the archive and vice versa, that the archive may influence in some way or benefit in some way. So we offer this sort of general model. It looks kind of like an oyster. So we call it the oyster model um, of understanding this sort of range of communities that surround every project. So there's the team or organization at the center, there are the direct partners who are making immediate contributions um, to the project or have some level of equity with the team at the center of the project. There are contributors who might be, for example, in Lakeland Digital Archives case, there's the surrounding community that's offering digital resources to the archives. They're providing family history materials, historical photographs, um, and so on to help complete the archive. Um, but they are not involved in every decision um, or they're not attending team meetings. So those are our contributors sort of strata here. There are users, so the folks who use the archive. And then there are communities that may never use the archive or haven't used the archive, certainly haven't contributed to it, but might someday, or that are allied in some other way. So these are potential um, allies to the project, um, people who are interested in or affected by the archive for some other reason, or affected by the project for some other reason. And another way of visualizing this, we've outlined a set of ways in which each of these groups contributes to the project differently. I won't dwell here, but the idea is projects that are sustainable in a community-centered way are able to understand this set of communities for themselves, and then they work to real people from the outermost communities towards the center of the project in different ways. They identify the unique roles that each level of that oyster, each sort of stratosphere, or each strata brings into the contribution to the sustainability of the project. How do partners contribute versus those potential speculative future communities, um, allied communities? They each have their own roles to play. And we outline these in the white paper. The second factor is understanding, in return, how the project supports the well being of those communities. And this is what makes the projects that I studied, I think, distinctive among many projects that I studied, which is that all of them are extremely service oriented. So they're 
very bent on serving the communities um, that immediately surround them, but also a wider group of communities. And this is actually how they define their sustainability. If they are serving these communities and their well being, they are sustainable. So um, every project has an immediate way that it's doing that. It's whatever the objective or mission of the project is. It's the reason the project was created in the first place. Um, but in my case studies, all of these projects also considered a number of other factors in how they were sustaining communities, including how they were sustaining them, not just through their main mission or objective. So in Lakeland's case, to create this functional digital archive, but also in the process, serving as a hub for communication and collaboration among community members. So not just the product, what they produced as being part of how they're benefiting the community, but the process of even creating the archive in the first place is helping sustain the community and bringing people into contact and having them collaborate. It was um, helping to tie the community closer together. Um, they also considered factors like is it advancing the careers of the vulnerable members of our teams, the young early career people, the people who are in um, unstable positions? Um, is it helping them or is it skilling our broader community? Is it providing them access to new skills that may benefit them down the line? Um, for those projects that are academic, um, another factor was whether they're supporting the advancement of a given domain of work or a discipline. Um, and then the last factor here is a critical one they're concerned with how their project is supporting community advocacy, activism, planning, and decision making. So this is translating the work of the project into real world impacts. In Lakeland's case, the archive became a sort of hub for work that eventually turned into a restorative justice initiative, which might be one of the first in the country to provide real tangible reparations to a community affected by urban renewal. So they translated the archival work and the process of communication and collaboration that created that archive into ultimately um, a real um, political movement with significant social impact. And that's how they understand sustainability. Is it having this real world impact? Okay, I won't dwell here. Um, and I kind of, I wanna come back to the set of questions for you, but just to have them in your minds. What exactly are you all hoping to sustain over time when you think about sustainability? How are you defining that for yourselves? And then what concerns you the most with regards to the sustainability of your own projects, your own events, your own digital resources? Um, I know we're low on time, so I just want to um, just show you a preview of the resources that I provided in the document Angela sent out. Um, I've organized them around each of these, this tripartite model of, um, of um, the objects of sustainability. So a set of resources about sustaining artifacts over time, um, a couple of resources on financial sustainability of organizations, and then um, some resources on sustaining communities. So I don't have time to get into digital curation, but the resources I provided, one is a case study of a big complex digital project and how they broke the project down into their tangible and intangible assets, including their communities of use and how they factor those into their sustainability planning. So just a really good read about this topic um, and about technical persistence of their digital objects and how it becomes um, enmeshed in the sustainability of something that's a little bigger and more social. And then I provided a set of resources um, to help you with the logistics and the granular planning around saving and sharing things like research data. So I know many of you are working with data and this is um, a set of resources. These are both the top two are from um, academic libraries from the University of Illinois and Northwestern University. Just examples of the kinds of open access resources that are out there that libraries provide for navigating questions about data management. So this, the top one, for example, has a really good um, sort of workflow, interactive workflow to help you make decisions about where to keep your data to keep it safe um, or how to host your web services or whatever the case may be. Um, and then a, a link to a, a um, registry of repositories for research data and a set of primers on specific data types. So these are examples of the kinds of resources that are out there to support research data management that we can talk more about in the next section. Um, and I don't have time to talk about social media archiving um, specifically. So these are all about research data. 
but you might be hoping to persist or preserve other kinds of things like social media, um, your organization's social media work. Um, we can talk more about that, but I've provided a link to an open access and open source set of tools to support community-driven and ethical social media archiving. I will say most of these tools, um, yeah, the recent developments with Twitter have compromised the usefulness of several of these tools for now, but the site still provides some really useful guidance on the ethical questions involved and decision making around how to archive social media. So still very useful, regardless of the technical implications. Um, a set of resources on financial sustainability. The first comes from a big library organization. The goal of it is to give you some implementation guidance for financial sustainability for small organizations. And then the second has to do with, it's focused on community archiving and funding models, but I think it sheds some really interesting light on um, alternative and evolving and emergent nonprofit models of financial sustainability, maybe worth exploring. And finally, um, there's the white paper I provided um, to help you think about sustaining communities themselves. And in addition to the white paper, I've offered um, these is a couple of really cool tools. One is uh, called the Socio-Technical Sustainability Roadmap. It's meant to um, be a hands-on sort of interactive workshop to help you think through the components of your project and how to keep them around over time, what they're bringing to the table. And the last is a resource library to help you cultivate and engage communities and um, bring them more actively into your work. Okay, so I thought I would just provide some example resources that we could talk through based on our conversation about these questions. What are you hoping to sustain and what can you know what concerns you most um, about sustainability? So thank you. I'll leave it there and we can chat. Thank you. Maybe a big round of applause for Katrina. I know it's a limit, a lot of information to cover in a limited amount of time. So thank you. I think that was really nice as a framework for thinking about um, not just as you posed it, right? How do I get community to engage in my resources? But more importantly, how do I feedback and how do I sustain community through the resources we're generating? So I really appreciate that.